Good noon, everyone. My name is John McCarthy. I am the Vice President for Historic Sp Spanish Point Campus for Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. And I am so happy that you have joined us this afternoon. And I want to extend the appreciation of the entire organization to you for um, participating in our lecture today, where we're going to talk about the relationship between Claude Monet and Bertha Honoré Palmer. And I want to send a special thank you to Jennifer Ramanecki, our CEO and president of Marie Selby Botanical Gardens, for inviting me to do this talk. Everybody knows I'm interested in history. Maybe everybody didn't realize how much I appreciated art. But doing the research to put this program together has blended both of those uh, interests. And I have had an amazing time learning so many things about Claude Monet and Bertha Honore Palmer. I'd also like to thank Hermione Gilpin our vice president for organizational advancement, and she is helping out driving this little train today as we explore art history and uh, the relationship to the exhibition that we have going on now. And uh, I really just appreciate everyone joining us today. So um, I wanna go ahead and, and get started with the slides and uh, jump right in and share with you uh, what we have to offer today. So again, Bertha Palmer and Claude Monet. Uh, if you have questions that come to mind while I'm presenting, just use the chat and go ahead and enter the question whenever you think about it so you don't have to worry about remembering. And then we're gonna take a little break midway through, answer some questions. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions as well. So please use that little chat, which you can find by going down to the bottom of the screen, that little black bar, and you'll see the little chat option there. Well, let's get started. So I wanted to do a little compare and contrast with Claude Monet and Bertha Honoré Palmer. And frankly, it was easier to compare than it was to contrast. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. So Monet was born in 1840. He was of French ancestry. Um, his parents had actually been in Paris for two generations, his family, and so they were well-known Parisians. Um, he loved nature, and of course he loved gardens. He was an innovator uh, in art in a huge way. Um, and for that, he was appointed uh, and honored with the French Legion of Honor status. He left a lasting legacy, which we're going to talk about today, and his gardens are preserved and still enjoyed today, and that's very, very important. Okay, Bertha Honoré Palmer, born a few years later, 1849, also of French ancestry. On this particular image, you'll see her little French fleur-de-lis uh, brooch, and she wore that often to call attention to her ancestry. She loved nature and gardens, as we well know. She was an innovator in many ways, in business, in agriculture, in real estate development, and in art, just like Claude Monet. And she was nominated to the French Legion of Honor for her service and her work with the um, Paris Expo of 1900. But as I understand it, she declined the honor, feeling it wasn't right for an American to receive a foreign award. She too last, left a lasting legacy and her gardens are enjoyed today. Uh, one more little interesting fact that they both share in common. Um, both uh, Monet had two sons and Bertha and Potter Palmer had two sons. So they had a lot in common. Well, let's just get to the point. Um, she bought 90 plus or minus of his paintings. She was the largest purchaser of Impressionist art and in particular that of Monet. She just loved his art. Um, he then, this, these purchases by Bertha came at a very critical time uh, where he was given the opportunity to actually purchase the property at Giverny that he had been renting. And so her investments, he invested back in the home and gardens 
there in Giverny, which I find fascinating. Of course, she really catalyzed more than any other one person the appreciation for this very modern Impressionist art here in America and throughout the world. And she visited his gardens, and we believe that the gardens that he created at Giverny actually inspired her to create the water garden here at Osprey Point, part of our historic Spanish Point campus. So let's just talk a little bit more about Claude because um, you know, I don't expect everyone to know his background, but a few key things. Um, as a youth, his family actually moved from Paris west and north uh, along the Seine. They moved to the mouth of the Seine River where it joins the English Channel to Le, Le Havre. And in Le Havre, that was the perfect place for his father to set up business because he was in the ship's chandlery business and ran a grocery. And so this was where all the action was at the mouth of the Seine, English Channel. And, um, and by the way, um, Monet's mother was an accomplished singer. So he had been exposed to art in the home. He had started with charcoal, charcoal sketching on paper. And it wasn't until 1857 that he began to use oils. And this was because he met an artist named Eugene Baudin. And Baudin took him out and showed him how to use oils, and they painted out of doors, which was almost unheard of at the time. You know, all the painters were working in studios. They were copying the works of the old masters. They were, they were into realism. They were trying to make it the way we would call it today, a photographically accurate copy. And yet that's not what these painters were all about. And one of the things that I learned was that even Baudin, he was influenced by the Dutch painter, Johan Jonkine, who told him, get out of the studio, get outside, paint in the plain air, and it will come to you. So uh, at the age of 20, um, Claude was actually drafted into the French military, uh, did service in North Africa, and when he was there, he was captivated by the changing effects of the light during the course of the day. Um, he would have done a seven-year stint in the military, except for that Dutch painter, Johan, talked uh, Monet's aunt into funding art classes for him. And because he was then going to school, he was able to get out of the rest of his military service. But his time in Algeria was very important in him realizing that he wanted to capture the changing light on the landscape. And by the way, I included this um, little uh, painting here on the left uh, because it is so exquisitely impressionist and so very different than the art that people were used to at the time. The color, the movement, the, the, the brush strokes, everything about it was different. So let's take a look at where Bertha's art inspiration came from. This is the same thing we did when we studied her gardens. Where did she get these ideas in the first place? Well, she was well-educated and exposed to art at an early age. She spoke several languages. She played several musical instruments. Um, and her art appreciation was really enhanced by the social status of her families, not just the Potter Palmer family, but the Honoré family. They would have had art in their home, and art was very important to um, the class of people who were developing Chicago at this time, and art went hand in hand with business. Now, we can't forget that Potter Palmer had a strong role in the art collecting as well. It wasn't just Bertha out there buying paintings and other art. And Potter Palmer was born in New York in 1826, moved to Chicago in 1852, opened up a dry goods store that had a no questions asked return policy. And it was one of the first places to use large display windows to display ready to wear clothes. This ultimately would be sold and is now known as Marshall Fields. He built the Palmer House Hotel, the original one, as a wedding gift to Bertha in 1871. 13 days later, it burned to the ground. But when they were on their honeymoon, they engaged Hiram Powers, an American sculptor who was working in Italy to carve marble busts of Potter and Bertha. And that was their first acquisition of art together on their honeymoon in Europe. And Potter for years had supported the arts in Chicago and the Chicago Academy of Design. 
which is what we now know as the Art Institute of Chicago. And he certainly encouraged Bertha's purchase of art as an investment, as something to love and appreciate and fill the home. So again, before the fire, uh, Potter had advocated for art school and exhibition of paintings. This is what got him involved in the School of Design. And then after the fire, he helped resurrect the Academy of Design, uh, which then changed its name to the Art Institute of Chicago, where he was appointed to the Board of Trustees in 1877, where he would also be followed by his sons who served on the Board of Trustees as well. Now, another opportunity that Bertha Palmer had to intersect with art was during the construction of the castle on Lakeshore Drive, 1883 to 1885. And just to kind of put this in perspective, look at the interior view of the castle. She had French drawing room, Spanish music room, English dining room, Moorish Renaissance library, which was actually hand carved wood that was removed from a castle in Europe murals all over the home, Chinese porcelains, antiques and art objects from all around the world, a Moorish bedroom paneled in ebony with gold trim and a French sitting room. So this house was basically a work of art and she was involved in working directly with the architect to make all this happen. Now, this is what the art looked like at the time. And so Bertha Palmer was collecting American artists, American masters, uh, artists of the Hudson River School. And you can see, for instance, the example of George Brush, uh, an American artist who was replicating the work of the Renaissance with very dark, dark imagery and light just to highlight the faces of this family portrait. And so again, these artists were copying the works of the old masters. They were working within studios. Now, then we moved to George Ennis, another artist that Bertha Palmer invested in buying his paintings as well. He was part of that Hudson River School landscape artist, really capturing the American landscape in a way that had never been done before, but still kind of hamstrung by tradition, uh, breaking out a little bit, um, definitely doing some work outside, but not exclusively out of doors. And then there was the Barbizon School represented here by Karat. Um, this was a French movement that took place uh, in a colony in Fontainebleau Forest, just south of Paris. And these artists were play painting plain air. They were outdoors in the forest, uh, along the streams and lakes, and painting what they saw in front of their eyes, but still somewhat hamstrung by wanting to satisfy the taste of the clients of the day who were looking for things that kind of looked like the old masters. But the Barbizon School was really the first tremendous departure. And then this is one of the early, early oil paintings by Claude Monet. And this one is 1858. So he's only 18 years old. And this is really just outside of where the home was there along the coastline. And you see poplar trees. You see this gorgeous sky with the clouds moving by. You see the water so carefully done with the reflection of the poplar trees in the background. And again, this is looking a lot like a Hudson River School or Barbizon School uh, type of painting. And then I, I thought this uh, was a really nice painting of Monet in his younger years done by his colleague Renoir. And then this painting, um, one of our volunteers at the Historic Spanish Point Campus brought this to me one day and said, John, this is the painting that started it all and how right he was. This is called Impression Sunrise. It was painted in 1872. It's on the Seine River. It's unlike any painting that anyone had ever seen before. And it was exhibited two years later in what was called the Exhibition of Misfits. And these were the Impressionist artists who were not welcome in the Academy Salon. Uh, and so they struck off on their own and created their own Exhibition of Misfits where this painting appeared and the title of it gave a name to the movement. And the Impressionist movement was then on its way. And then look at this one. Okay, so this is so different than any art, oil paintings that people had seen before. 
And this is Cliff Walk at Corville. So this is north of the mouth of the Seine River. This is, this is up north where the English Channel is meeting um, the Straits of Dover. And this is the beginning of the White Cliffs of Dover. So if we were looking at this from the sea, we would be looking at those sheer white cliffs. But this is from the top. And you see color and you see movement and you can you can feel the air, the breeze, and you see the clouds and the bright colors. And then the brush strokes, so different than the realistic work that preceded it. Um, but this Impressionist art was all about the changing light, the brilliant color, and the movement that was built into the work. And then we get to what we've all been calling haystacks, which are actually wheat stacks. But here's the thing, as we talked about with the garden uh, discussion that we had at historical briefing, changes were occurring uh, in architecture, in landscape architecture, in garden design. And with that came these changes toward the impressionist style of art. So the world was turning, traditions were being left behind and those traditions had existed for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden there was this new art. And again, they were not invited to the salon Monet continued to submit his paintings for entrance into the uh, salon and they kept turning him down. And that was what inspired that salon exhibition of misfits. I'll also say that this is a lot like what we'll learn about the Florida Highwaymen artists when we have that exhibition this summer. And so some of the other influences on Bertha Palmer, this woman, Sarah Hollowell was critical um, she actually introduced herself to Potter Palmer in 1873. She was a Quaker. He was a Quaker. Perhaps they met at a friend's meeting, or perhaps she reached out to him because she was trying to get American uh, people of wealth and influence to recognize the Impressionist artists in France. And she, here in America, had organized an interstate industrial exposition in 1878 that continued for over a decade. Uh, and this brought art and design together in an exposition. Um, she is who introduced the Palmers to Paul Durand Brel, who we will talk about more later, but he was the agent or the salesman, so to speak, for the Impressionist artist. And without that introduction, none of this would have been possible. So Sarah Hollowell is a critical, critical key figure in Bertha Palmer's appreciation for the Impressionist. Um, she became the assistant chief of the Department of Fine Arts for the 1893 Columbian Exposition, not just the women's building, but for the entire exposition. And she actually brought the Palmers by car out into the French countryside, brought them out to Fontainebleau Forest to meet the Barbizon School artists. And they were so delighted that Bertha would speak to them in French, fluent French and communicate with them. And she fell in love with the work they were doing. And of course, began to buy painting after painting. And just to kind of wrap it up and bring this full circle, um, here's the gentleman that actually um, introduced Monet to Paul Durand's rule, the agent, the salesman, the art dealer. That was critically important to Monet's future. Um, Daubigny was a member of the Barbizon School, working there in Fontainebleau Forest. And he had, with Monet and several other artists, and actually Paul durand Rule, had fled Paris at the beginning of the Franco-Prussian War. And they went to London. And that's where they all met. And so this is where Daubigny meets Monet. Pizarro introduces them to Paul durand Rule and started a chain reaction. And so the relationships is what's so important here. And actually, when they returned after the war uh, from London, uh, Monet and Daubigny went to Holland, where they painted for several months and then came back to France. Now, here's Paul Durand's rule, and he was tremendously significant to the promotion of the Impressionist artists and very significant to the collecting by the Palmer family. He was the first art dealer to embrace the Impressionists. Again, he met uh, Monet and Pizarro and others in London in 1870, uh, and then introduced by Sarah Hollowell. So that kind of connects us the whole thing. 
And he actually organized a traveling exhibition in the States in 1886 with the Impressionist art, and it was panned. The critics hated it. They, everyone kind of turned it down and they did not pay attention until Bertha Palmer did. And then everybody started paying attention. Uh, he actually uh, established a gallery in New York in 1887, and that gallery was not exclusively Impressionist art. That included old American masters, old masters from Europe, as well as the Barbizon School, who he also marketed. Now, in his career working with the art, he sold 5,000 Impressionist paintings. He would buy them in advance from the artists. He would pay the bills of the artists if they were having trouble paying their bills. He would purchase art on spec. And he really started ramping this up prior to the 1893 World's Fair when Bertha Palmer was going to Europe, basically buying everything that she could buy and talking to all the artists about exhibiting in America and sharing their art with the world. He really loaded up and it was funds that he fronted to Claude Monet that allowed Monet to buy the home and gardens at Giverny, which then inspired all the rest of his work. So this is just a tremendous history. And then we can't leave out Mary Cassatt, an artist herself, American born, but moved to Paris in 1866, set up a studio just up the street from Impressionist artist Edgar Degas, who was working with pastels. And she learned to work with pastels, worked quite a bit with Degas and bounced back and forth between the two studios. She actually was selected by Bertha Palmer in 1891 to paint a large mural called Modern Women for the end of the women's building. And on the other end would be another mural called Primitive Women. And this was to show the difference between the primitive women who were working and the modern women who were appreciating art and the finer things in life and running businesses and things like this. She became a tremendous friend of Bertha and with Sarah did most of the advising that helped Bertha connect with other artists and build her collection. Mary Cassatt was also a, uh, tremendous advocate for women's rights the time before that was popular. Okay, so now I think we're just gonna take a minute, see if we have any questions, and then um, we'll go back to the program. Hi, John, we do actually have uh, quite a few questions um, coming in, um, yeah. most of them related uh, to the Palmers themselves. Um, including, could you just uh, refresh all of us? And I know that I'm going to throw it back a little bit to um, the historical briefing on Bertha Palmer's gardens, but sure. could you remind us about the age difference between Bertha and Potter Palmer and the change in gardens from Victorian to Edwardian and why that was such a transformative moment for both sure. gardens sure. as well as art and architecture? Thanks for mining. So um, Bertha was 21 when she married a 44 year old Potter Palmer. Um, that might seem like a big age spread for us today, but that was not unusual back in that era. Um, and, you know, she was born of an exceptionally wealthy family. Um, the Honoré family goes way back in French uh, aristocracy. And, you know, she grew up, uh, you know, in Kentucky and then her family moved to Chicago. Uh, where she then met Potter Palmer, actually at a large party that was hosted by her father at the Honoré Mansion. And then in terms of her gardens, you know, Bertha Palmer wasn't following everyone else. She was kind of cutting her own turf. And um, so in the case of the gardens, you know, gardens were dominated by Victorian ideals, which was complete formality, symmetry, squares inside of squares inside of squares. And you know, she found much more appealing some of the things that uh, were happening in Italian gardens and French gardens, and then the English gardens of King Edward VII after the passing of his mother, Queen Victoria, and he was quick to mobilize to change things up. And so the difference being that with the, Edward, with the Edwardian garden, you kept the formality of certain gardens, particularly those closest to your residence, but then you connected them through nature to other gardens that were seen as rooms in nature. So if folks are really interested in that, we can uh, make available to them the historical briefing that talked about that or come down to Historic Spanish Point campus and see it right here in our very own Marie Selby Botanical Gardens setting. So um, yeah. Great, thank you so much for explaining that, John. Uh, we have some questions coming in about Bertha's relationship with Monet himself. Um, and how he, she actually ended up purchasing many of his pieces. Were they through the art dealer specifically, or did she visit Monet multiple times 
throughout her lifetime. Most of the purchases were through Paul Durand Rel, but she did visit um, Monet in his gardens at Giverny that in a certain elegant way, she had actually helped to fund. So uh, she must have felt pride in that. You know, he had lived there, I think, almost 15 years as a tenant. And then the owner of the property came to him and said, I have to sell. And he didn't have any money, but uh, he had a lot of money coming his way. So uh, that worked out really, really well. Um, but there's, there's some suggestion that she would have visited with him multiple times. But the only one that I could pin down was actually in 1892, which... Um, 1890, 1891, 1892, 1893, she was buying 15 paintings a month. Okay, so there was a lot of investment being made, and not all in Monet's, but in Impressionist art and Barbizon school. Absolutely. Well, and um, another question coming in about the relationship with uh, Mary Cassatt. Um, she, she purchased quite a few of her paintings, correct? Yes. And she also was quite a sponsor of other female artists, if I recall. Well, there, sure. So she enlisted uh, Mary uh, McMonies, who uh, painted the primitive woman mural there at the uh, Columbian Exposition in the Women's Building, and also um, an artist named Bert uh, Marizo, who was actually accepted by the salons when she did a certain style of art, but then she started moving toward the Impressionists. And so she, actually in 1874, she joined the exhibition of the Rejecteds and associated herself with the Impressionists from here on out. So she was another one. And then there was another artist, uh, Marie Lovinson, who was both a painter and a sculptor uh, that Bertha had invested somewhat in her art. So those are four female artists. And I have to tell you for that time period, there weren't a whole lot of other female artists. So I think Bertha was touching those who she could touch and investing in art from those that she loved. And one of the things that her sister Ida talked about was that Bertha just didn't just buy paintings because they were Monet or Pizarro or, or Corot or whoever. She bought what appealed to her senses. And she knew what she liked and she honed right in on it, you know? And I think that's fascinating because you should buy art that you love, not because it's gonna be an investment, because you love it and you wanna live with it. Absolutely. And I know we're getting a lot of questions coming in now about Bertha's collection uh, overall and where well, it actually it. ends up, um, where the entire collection ends up. So I think we should probably move on to the second half of the program. Very good, let's, let's share screen again. And I've got to get to, let me get to where I need to be here. Okay, so we'll talk about the acquisitions. So this is the very first Impressionist painting that Bertha purchased. It's by Edgar Degas, Pastel, on the stage. It's got movement, it's got light. Um, it was purchased in 1889 for $500. She loved this painting. The Columbian Expo, the run up to the Columbian Expo, 1893. This is what really made it all happen. Were it not for this exposition, I don't know that the Impressionist artists would have ever reached the audience that they were able to reach through Bertha Palmer, through this exhibition. And so Bertha Palmer in 1890, um, 1891 was all over Europe, uh, getting art, asking artists to send art, you know, meeting with royalty to send all these different aspects of life throughout the world to be exhibited here at the Columbian Exposition. And so, um, this was really the catalyst that drove all the interest. And then this is uh, an image. Boy, it would be nice if we had an image of Claude Monet and Bertha Palmer in the garden. But instead, the closest thing I could come is uh, Monet actually entertaining the sons of Paul Durand Rule, the art dealer. And so this is one of his sons next to Monet. And then fixing her hair is the other son's wife. And, and the other son has actually taken the photograph. And then other friends of the family here. And so, you know, Monet was very welcoming for people to come to his gardens. And then, of course, hopefully they'd fall in love with his art and uh, purchase something to keep, keep him going. And this is a wonderful image 
of the inside of the art gallery that was built as an addition to the castle for the purpose of exhibiting art in the run up to the Columbian Exposition. And so it was a 90 foot long addition to the castle and it was lined with rose red velvet on all the walls. And then you can see the art, which at one time was actually displayed with American masters on the lowest level, Barbizon school in the middle and impressionists at the top. But that's not exactly how we see it here. I should point out that when it came time to hang the art here, um, it was Sarah Hollowell who worked with Bertha to position all of the paintings and to lay it all out. And she had tremendous experience in doing this. And also to light the art properly, uh, Paul Durand Rule actually set up all the lighting here in the gallery. And Bertha Palmer opened this gallery up in her home to the general public um, in 1893. And the uh, exhibition was said to welcome uh, everyone from paupers to princesses. And the uh, editorial comment was that there were a lot of strange glances at the paintings. And so you could imagine that, you know, people could kind of get the American masters. They were used to seeing that sort of art. Barbizon school, eh, not so much. And when it came to Impressionists, it was all brand new. Moving up in time to 1910, Bertha Palmer has come to Sarasota and Osprey. She's acquired the property that which she would call Osprey Point, and she brought her artwork with her. Um, she furnished the Oaks home with the Impressionist art. She surrounded herself with the art that she loved. And while she was moving in down here in Osprey and getting things settled and getting all of her various development interests settled and buying cattle and cattle ranches and extending the railroad down to Venice and buying 32,000 acres south of Clark Road and doing all these other things, she actually has an art exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago. I think it was 51 of her paintings uh, that she loaned for this exhibition. And it was a combination of American masters, Barbizon school artists and impressionist artists. And here's her largest painting. This is this huge canvas. Um, and this was painted by Siobhan and it's the sacred grove of the lovers of art and it's kind of pure Barbizon school, a uh, little fantasy. And, um, but there you have it. And we are so fortunate to actually have a little brochure from the exhibition that was used when the Palmer representatives went to pick up all the art after the exhibition. So on the lower right-hand side, you see here all received in good order P. Furman for Mrs. Potter Palmer, and that's in November of 1910. But in the spring of 1910 and, and through November, all of this was on exhibit. And so you see various, uh, various artists and the works all listed in the little check marks for when they were delivered and then picked back up. And then just a little close up view of the Monet section because the program today really focused on Monet. And you see uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Monet paintings were a part of this exhibition in 1910. So in summary, uh, Bertha handled approximately 90 Monet paintings. She did not keep all of them. She bought them, she sold them, she sold them to her friends. She encouraged them to buy others. I found one example where she bought and sold one particular painting three different times. And she kind of got someone interested and then she decided she wanted it back. So she bought it back, sold it again, bought it back. Her purchases would inspire other collectors. I mean, she was the one that really got everybody interested in this. And her collection of wheat stacks is the largest extent. And, and a goodly portion of it is still together today in the Art Institute of Chicago. So let's take a look at some of the paintings that she bought and that are a part of the collection at the Art Institute. This is a very early painting, 1868. So Monet is 20 years old. He's 28 years old at this time. This is on the bank of the Seine at Benico. And this is just a little bit um, northwest of Paris. 
not quite to Giverny. And this is before Monet started working in Giverny. So this was just along the Seine River, beautiful scene. Again, you can kind of see how people would look at this and kind of scratch their head because it didn't look like the realism of the old masters. And, you know, today we'd say it didn't look like a photograph, but this was very different than that. This was creating an impression. Your mind would put the rest of the detail in. So you can see why this wasn't immediately accepted by the masses. Only a unique person like Bertha Palmer could see the magic in this and, and the future in this. And then this one, now this is actually, uh, Bordigera is down on the coast of Italy, just a little bit east of the border with France. And so Monaco and Nice are over on the France side. And this scene is about the same distance from the border on the Italy side as Monaco is on the French side. And this is just pure impressionist art. You can smell the salt air. Just think about it. You can feel the breeze. You hear the leaves rustling. Um, and, and then the sunlight lighting up the little village there right on the, the, um, right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And the richness of the color, the way light is used, all of this was so new and unique and might be, you know, to us, we look at it and say, well, that's an impressionist painting, but no one had ever seen anything like this before. And then this is just a little bit north of where uh, Monet's family lived at the mouth of the Seine River. So this is just a little bit north. This is a fishing village of Etretat, and you can see the departure of the boats. This is 1885. And, you know, again, um, Real sketchy, very impressionist, not like what people were used to seeing, but the boats are almost in a symphony out there on the water, or maybe they're like a school of fish. And you can see the wives all gathered down at the shore, seeing their husbands off, maybe never to see them again, which is kind of the lot of a, of a fisherman's wife. You never know when it's going to be that last voyage. And then also you see these huts, these huts that look a little bit like haystacks. Well, those aren't huts at all. Those are boats. Those are the fishing boats that they would cover up like this in off season. So we've got three boats sitting here that aren't getting launched today and the rest of the boats are all getting launched. And again, you know there's a wind in the air because you can see it in the sails and you can see the gorgeous uh, turquoise water of the English Channel. And, um, and you see a little bit of this building which gives it a sense of place because this isn't an imaginary place. This is a real place that he was up in another building looking down and painting this scene. And then this one, um, and this is down in the south central uh, part of France, very much south of Paris on the Petit Cruz River. This painting is from 1889. And if I didn't tell you that there was a river in there, you probably wouldn't even see it. But you can see the river coming around a bend. And you can see that the this was probably springtime. There's a lot of water flowing downstream. There's actually waves uh, and a rough surface on the river. But you also see uh, the sunlight coming up over the hill. And again, this idea of Monet capturing a moment in time, a certain light on the landscape, catching the waves, catching the leaves on the tree, catching the top crest of that hill is what it was all about. And these aren't just any Monet paintings. These paintings I'm showing you now are all paintings that were purchased by Bertha and then uh, bequeathed to the Art Institute of Chicago and a part of their collection today. Now, I thought maybe a little geography would help to kind of get us all organized and, and oriented. So you've got Paris in the center there in the blue star. Um, you've got Benico, where I showed you that one early painting just a little bit. Um, along the Seine, and then Giverny, further along the Seine, about one third of the way down to the English Channel. And then you have um, where Monet grew up in Le Havre, and then the uh, little fishing village of Etretat, and then Portville with the White Cliffs of Dover up north of there, and then the Cruz River down in the south of France, and the Bordigera, uh, Italy. And so this kind of gives you a sense of the Monet was reaching out all over France and beyond the border to find new scenes to paint, you know, new images to capture, new nature to appreciate. And then also um, just wanted to show you Fontainebleau Forest, just south of Paris, also on the Seine, 
Um, and that was where the Bar Barbizon School Colony lived in the woods, lived and painted in the forest. And so now let's talk about the haystacks. They're actually stacks of wheat. And while everybody commonly calls them haystacks, these were not feed for cattle or cows or livestock. Um, these were a critical way to set aside wheat and barley and oats to get through the winter for the community. And uh, this is a beautiful painting with two uh, stacks of wheat. It was painted in 1889. Um, it's uh, one of the original Bertha Palmer paintings, which was a gift of Arthur Wood Sr. Uh, to the Art Institute of Chicago in memory of Pauline Palmer Wood. It's just an amazing haystack painting. But again, think about people were used to the European realists, the Renaissance type art, and now they're looking at these fuzzy haystacks. What's going on? So this is the view out of uh, Monet's home, looking out on the landscape, and you see that the, the wheat stacks were close at hand. So think of these, and, and, and you see the ladders up on these stacks. So these were 20 feet or more in height. These were huge. And you need to think of this, again, not as hay, but this is beer and bread for the winter. That's what these converted to. And here's another uh, in the Stacks of Wheat series. And so what Monet was doing was painting them at all seasons, in all lights. Here's one Stacks of Wheat snow effect, sunset, 1889. He painted 30 of the wheat stack paintings. He exhibited 13 of them, sold all 30 of the ones that he had, regretted having sold them in a sense because he thought they should all stay together. Bertha Palmer acquired nine of them and had the largest collection. But we don't know that she kept them together because it's more likely that she had a couple in Chicago and a couple down here in Osprey and a couple in Paris and a couple in London. And in all of her homes, she probably had some of them, but she at least kept the collection intact in terms of ownership. And then when some of those transferred to the Art Institute of Chicago, it helped to build that nucleus there as well. So here's another scene. This one is stacks of wheat, snow effect in the morning. Again, 1891, these were all painted in 1891, 1892. This particular painting um, shows example of the haystack being moved, uh, where he started painting in one location, then he, then he finished it in another. Um, the other thing is all these paintings have been studied heavily. They actually have studied the fabric in the canvas, and they can connect various paintings to like the same roll of canvas, which I think is fascinating. And then here's one of the very few images that we have of the interior of the uh, castle on Lakeshore Drive. Again, this is Bertha Palmer's private art gallery with the rose red velvet on the walls. And you can see a little bit off to the right-hand side of the center, one of the Monet wheat stack paintings right there for all to see. And you also see that it appears that maybe the paintings were being rehung at this time because they're not all over the wall. There's just really one row down by the ground and then one row midway up. So there were changes taking place in the gallery at that time. The idea of doing multiples was all about Claude Monet's fascination with the changing sunlight and its impact on the visual effect that it made. And so he did series of poplar trees. And then he did, of course, his famous water lilies. Once the gardens had fully developed at Giverny, this became almost his sole uh, passion was painting these water lilies that he had actually created the area for them to grow and now he's painting them. And the very first paintings that he did of them were all very vertical, um, almost inspired by Japanese prints and they all had the Japanese bridge in the back. And then he shifted and this is 1916, so much later, he shifted to doing the huge, large canvases just of the water lilies. So this idea of a series to show the same place, different time, different light, different impression, hence impressionist art. And Bertha Palmer uh, wanting to see her collection stay with the family, but also wanting a part of her collection to go to the Art Institute of Chicago, um, she wrote into her will that her sons were to select $100,000 worth of paintings to make a donation to the Art Institute of Chicago. So Potter Palmer Jr. and Honoré Palmer went through the collection. They made their selections, $100,000 worth of art. 
Then they contributed $400,000 worth of additional paintings and then another $350,000 worth of additional paintings. So it was a tremendous uh, contribution to the Art Institute of Chicago, to the history of art globally. And um, the, it started basically, uh, it, it, it caused the Art Institute of Chicago to be the nucleus of modern art, this modern art back in the 1900s. And so um, to this day, the Art Institute of Chicago has this largest collection of Impressionist art, all because of the Palmer family. Now, I want to fast forward because we kind of got to wrap things up today. But you know, World War II was tough on everybody, but after the war, um, I recently obtained these photographs of Giverny after the war. And so the gardens were in a little bit of disrepair. They hadn't had all the care that they had required, but people were still coming to the site to see the paintings and to see the gardens. And here you see right there within the home, a number of Monet's paintings on display after World War II. Um, and after he had passed away. And the same thing was taking place here where Gordon Palmer, the grandson of Bertha Palmer, had come back after serving in World War II, opened up the Oaks House again to the public, including the collection of Impressionist paintings, including those by Claude Monet. And so here's the little brochure from the mid-1950s showcasing what you'll see at the Oaks. Um, in Osprey and included there is the Haystack. And in the listing, it's Haystack by Claude Monet, 1891, in exhibit of representative French Impressionist art. So just imagine uh, that you could come and tour the gardens, tour the grounds, tour the home, and be exposed to this wonderful art as late as the late 1950s and early, early 1960s. So let's summarize by talking about the legacy that was created by an artist and a woman who loved his art. Bertha Honoré Palmer, with the help of her husband, Potter, uh, they were the first really to embrace this style. They boosted the value by creating demand and by buying the paintings and convincing their friends to do so. They increased awareness of Impressionism through the Columbian Exposition, through the exhibitions at the Art Institute of Chicago, and through opening up their own home to the citizens to come and see the art. The largest collection of Monet's, again, bought and sold upwards of 90 paintings, and the largest collection of wheat stacks at nine, holding together that vision of Monet that the wheat stacks belong together, not as individual art. And Bertha Palmer's donation, contribution, philanthropy toward the Art Institute of Chicago was followed by other Chicagoans who were also collecting Impressionist art. Martin and Kerry Ryerson. Ryerson was in at the early days of the Chicago Institute of Design with Potter Palmer. He was one of the founding trustees when they renamed it Art Institute of Chicago. He purchased the first Monet painting in 1891, a couple of years after Bertha, but you know, still in the game early and donated uh, the vast majority of their art collection to the Art Institute of Chicago in 1933. Now, 1933 was a key year because you had the Century of Progress exhibition going on, another World's Fair, and that was a big deal. And then another uh, Chicagoan, Annie Swan Coburn, she began collecting art after her husband passed away. First the American masters, then the impressionists, turned on by Bertha Honoré Palmer and a very, very large exhibition at the very end of her life where she loaned over a hundred paintings and they never came back to her home because she passed away during the run of the exhibition and they were all donated to the Art Institute of Chicago. So between the Coburn collection, the Ryerson collection and the Palmer collection, it's the largest collection of impressionist work, certainly on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. Was it a good investment? You know, Bertha was paying $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 for a Monet back in the 1890s because, you know, she kind of got into trouble. The more she bought, the higher the prices went. She had to pay a little bit more. So just two years ago, this painting, which was originally purchased by Bertha Palmer, um, sold at Sotheby's for $110 million, setting a record for Impressionist art and certainly uh, clarifying that her investment was a good one. So I also like to also point out how interesting it is that it's, it's, it seems so obvious that it was her money 
that allowed um, this unknown artist who couldn't sell his paintings until she really started buying them all up, that allowed him to purchase the home and gardens that he loved so much at Giverny. But then by her going there and seeing his water gardens that he had created there for the water lilies, created her own natural water garden here at what's now historic Spanish Point campus of Marie Selby Botanical Gardens. And that the Monet paintings were right here, right in the Oaks home, just directly north of where our campus is in Osprey, Florida. What an amazing connection between Monet and Bertha Palmer. And so I think what I've learned from all of this that I never thought of in this way before is that Bertha Palmer's furious purchase of underappreciated at the time paintings provided Monet with the resources to purchase and enhance the property of Giverny, which then inspired a tremendous body of his later work and by extension, that of Roy Lichtenstein, while also influencing Bertha Palmer's gardens here at Osprey Point. Here's those wonderful gardens at Giverny. And if you can't fly to Paris or you can't fly to France, just come to the downtown campus and absorb all that we have there, where Roy Lichtenstein interprets Monet's interpretation of the landscapes of France in a pop art impressionist way. What an amazing power of two campuses to weave this story together that touches us here in Sarasota as it touches people in Chicago and touches people with impressionist art all around the world. So that brings us to the last opportunity for questions. Thank you so much, John. We had some wonderful um, questions coming in and I think you really explained the legacy of Bertha Palmer and her collection, especially um, as it relates to the Art Institute. Um, we had a really interesting question come in of whether there was any correspondence that Bertha had with Monet and whether that survived to this day. I don't know if you found anything in your research for this program. Did not find, however, did find where there are archives of Palmer materials that we were not aware of. And so I think that this really, um, you know, Jennifer asking me to do this program really opened my eyes in a way they were never opened before. And um, I think it's gonna open some other doors for us as we now take a little bit of time to do a little further research as well. Um, but I have not seen anything directly. I think that, you know, most of the correspondence would have been with uh, Durand Rule, you know, and, um, but who knows, she could have, she was a prolific writer, she wrote letters all the time. And uh, what's kind of amazing to me is just how much she always had going on at every moment of her life, she'd be working on like six different things at a time and handling everything so well, and so, um, so thoughtfully. Absolutely. Um, we did have a question, speaking of um, Bertha's influence and encouraging others to purchase um, impressionist, impressionist art, is there anything that you managed to find that she knew Isabella Stewart Gardner, who was collecting in Boston during that time? I did not. Um, but uh, one thing I should point out, though, uh, I, I meant to mention it earlier, she would go to art exhibitions simply to get other people to go. And the community would describe it, or you know, they'd write it up in the paper and say that her presence there was an event in and of itself. Uh, and that people would put on their finest clothing uh, and uh, you know, to go and see the art. But if she was there, people wanted to be a part of it. And if she was buying the art, people wanted to buy. So um, we'll have to do a little research on Isabella and see if there's any connection there. Absolutely. Um, speaking of, you shared one of um, Bertha's purchases um, and the now cost of it. Do you have any idea of a price estimate for all 90 of those um, paintings that she purchased from Monet originally? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that you could assume that each and every one of them would sell for 110 million, but, you know, do the math at half of that for 90 paintings. Uh, now, again, you know, she didn't hold on to all of them. Um, right you know, she bought and sold and, and shared them with other people. Um, so, but a, uh, a small fortune. Absolutely, and, abs and completely priceless to this day, um, especially for the Art Institute who holds a majority of the collection. Um, were there any other museums that some of her pieces went to? Um, the family has retained quite a few of um, her original, uh, the original art collection, correct? 
Well, the family has retained um, some of the art, but but you'll see that the family had also has also donated art to the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, so there has been um, you know a legacy there as well. Um, seems like there was something else I wanted to share. Maybe the first part of your question, Hermione, that has escaped me. Um, Do you want me to ask another question, and we can come back to yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I think it, it is just important to realize that. You know, part of what she was doing was investing. Part of it, what she was doing was sharing the art and part of what she was doing was appreciating it. She felt that others should appreciate it as well. And they did. Absolutely. Now, of course, being- Oh, I know what the question was. It was, are any of her paintings in other museums? Well, they <laughs> are by sale. And so for instance, there are paintings in the Met that were donated by families who purchased from her. So you will find an attribution for Bertha Palmer on a number of paintings that are in other museums, but they didn't come from the Palmer family direct to the museum. They went through their interim uh, stewards, if you will. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, one being in Sarasota, we of course have a major art museum in the Ringling. Um, is there was there anything that you could find that John and Mabel Ringling overlapped with Bertha? Bertha Palmer, Bertha and Potter Palmer, and were influenced by their um, art collecting? No, there, there wouldn't have been any contact or influence. I mean, you know, John Ringling went the opposite. He was looking at the old masters, you know, the Baroque, the, the Renaissance period, you know. Um, I think what's important to realize, though, is that, you know, Ringling began opening his museum, which was done as a private art museum. You know, that was mm -hmm. his, his private art museum. He began opening it on certain days, I think is, you know, from the time it was brand new in 1929. But Bertha Palmer opened her private art gallery to the world in 1893. So she was a trendsetter. You know, and again, this idea of, you know, peasants to princesses, everybody was welcome. Um, and so she was out ahead of the game. Um, I, I suppose it could be said that, you know, by the Palmers supporting the Art Institute of Chicago and all the art classes that took place there and art lectures. And by the way, Bertha Palmer delivered art lectures there. She was known as a very strong presenter. Uh, when I read that, I thought, oh my gosh, now I have to live up to this legacy too. But, you know, they always said her, her presentations were information packed and exquisitely delivered. Um, but, um, you know, this idea of having art lessons, again, you know, Ringling did that in the 1930s with the original um, Ringling School of Art. Um, so um, the ideas were the same, but Bertha Palmer was, what, 30, 40 years ahead of him. <laughs> Absolutely. She was always ahead of her time. She was ahead um, of everybody. <laughs> so um, we've had a few questions speaking of her private art gallery um, at the castle, as well as the Oaks. Um, what happened to both of those properties? Where are they today mm. and their state? And I realize we're referencing as well the former historical briefing with this question. Sure. Well, um, the Oaks residence um, was removed from the site back in the 1960s. Um, after Gordon Palmer passed away um, at a young age, unfortunately, um, there really uh, wasn't anyone stewarding the property here as much, and um, the home began to fell into disrepair, and so it was um, seen as a nuisance to the neighborhood. In fact, I, I talked to a guy last night who said that he used to misbehave there as a youth. Uh, broke into the house and such like that. So apparently that was true in the house. Now, all the furnishings, um, furnishings were donated to Sarasota County uh, archives. Uh, her books, as I understand it now, were donated to the Ringling Museum. Uh, the art would have been removed back to family members or to Chicago. Uh, unfortunately, the castle had a similar fate. Uh, the castle was demolished uh, and replaced with an apartment building there on Lakeshore Drive. And so the castle no longer stands. Uh, it was at one time the largest residence in Chicago when it was built. It was the center of Chicago social life. Uh, as I recall, the last party that she hosted there, she invited 4,000 guests. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Um, well, it seems like we've come to the end of our questions, John. So any parting thoughts um, to close out the program? I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us for the historical briefing today and also encourage everyone to come out and see the exhibition. You know, it's going to run through most of June, but it's no time like tomorrow to come out and see it and see Lichtenstein's interpretation of Monet's interpretation of nature. 
And, um, you know, it's a tremendous, tremendous connection. And then to bring in the connection to Bertha Palmer almost sends chills up my spine. Um, I want to thank um, everyone who's kind of put up with me talking about Monet for the last month. And Hermione, in particular, for you for uh, driving the bus today. And again, to Jennifer Ramanecki, president and CEO, for challenging me to do a program on the connections between Bertha Honoré Palmer and Claude Monet. So it's been my pleasure. I've learned a lot. I love sharing what I know with our members. And so I look forward to my next opportunity, which is going to be talking about the Florida Highwaymen this summer, another confluence of history and art. So thanks for joining us, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for your great questions.